Science! Welcome to Science This Week, everybody. Um, first up, I've got some news from Cassini. I love checking in with stuff that we've talked about multiple times on this segment, and I can still remember seeing Cassini's final mission. And what's amazing about that mission is the amount of data that this one satellite orbiting Saturn for years has collected and the amount of stuff we're going to get from that in the years and years to come. We're pouring through all of that data, and it's incredible because we're still finding new discoveries. Case in point, we found some new stuff concerning Saturn's rings. Now, as Cassini dove close to Saturn in its final year, the spacecraft actually provided intricate details on the workings of Saturn's complex ring system. And the mission ended in 2017, um, and like I said, we're still finding all of this new data and as we're, as we're going through it all. This new paper published in, in Science in just last week, June 13th, um, describes results from four of Cassini's instruments taking their closest ever observations of the main rings. Findings include fine details of features sculpted by masses embedded within the rings. Now, we already knew that. We already knew that there are these small moon moons kind of in the rings, but we didn't really know how they're affecting the ring structure themselves. Textures and patterns from clumpy to straw-like pop out of the images, raising questions about the interactions that shape them. New maps reveal how colors, chemistry, and temperature actually change across the different rings. Like a planet under construction inside a disk of protoplanetary material, tiny moons embedded in Saturn's rings interact with the particles around them. Now, Saturn's rings are all named A through G, respectively. In that way, the paper provides further evidence that the rings are a window into the way our actual solar system was created and thus the universe. Um, a lot of what we see is this this ring like this uh, this this ring like structure in the universe and our solar system is one of those as well. If you look at the way all of the planets are, they make these rings around the sun basically. So we're looking at Saturn not only to see more information about how this planet is formed, but also how our entire solar system is formed. And that's really exciting. The observations also deepen scientists' understanding specifically of the ring system around, around Saturn. Scientists conclude that the outer edge of the main rings, a series of similar impact streaks in the F ring, have actually the same length and orientation showing that they were likely caused by a flock of impactors that all struck the ring at the same time. This shows that the ring is shaped by streams of material that orbit Saturn itself, rather than, for in instance, by like cometary debris that are moving around the sun that happen to crash into the rings, which is something that we thought was the case until we're getting this new data. Cassini scientist and lead author of this paper, Matt Tiscan Tis Carreno of the SETI Institute in California said these new details of how the moons are sculpting the rings in various ways provide a window into solar system formation, where you also have disks evolving under the influence of masses embedded within them. At the same time, new puzzles, new mysteries are arising out of this data, and they are being deepened by all of this latest research. The close-up ring images brought into focus three distinct textures, this clumpy-like texture, smooth texture, and also this streaky-like texture. And it made it clear that these texture occurs in belts with very sharp boundaries. They don't really blend together. Here's the smooth, and then, you know, then the streaky, then it's clumpy. That begs the question, why? Why does this happen? In many places, the belts aren't connected to any ring characteristics that we've yet to identify. Tiscanero went on to say, this tells us the way the rings look is not just a function of how much material there is. There has to be something different about the characteristics of the particles, perhaps affecting what happens when two ring particles collide and bounce off of each other. And we don't yet know what that is. 
Cassini's visible and infrared mapping spectrometer, or the VIMS, uncovered even another mystery. The spectrometer, which imaged the rings in visible and near infrared light, identified unusually weak water ice bands in the outermost part of the A ring. This was a surprise because we know that area is very highly reflective. And what we know about highly reflective areas in space, usually that's a sign of less contaminated ice and stronger water ice bands. The new spectral map also sheds light on the composition of the rings. While we already knew that water ice is a main component of Saturn's rings, the spectral map actually ruled out detectable ammonia ice and methane ice as ingredients. And it also doesn't see organic compounds. This is a big surprise because Cassini found that organic material was flowing from the D-ring into Saturn's atmosphere. So why aren't we seeing organic material in the outermost rings? Phil Nicholson, the Cassini VIMS scientist at Cornell, said if organics were there in large amounts, at least in the main A, B, and C rings, we'd see them. I'm not convinced yet that they are a major component of the main rings. This research signals the start of literally the next era of science concerning Saturn, thanks to the science we're getting from Cassini. Jeff Cousy, NASA Ames Research Center, um, inter interdisciplinary scientist for the Cassini mission, said, we see so much more and closer up and we're getting new and more interesting puzzles. We are just settling into the next phase, which is building new detailed models of ring evolution, including the next revelation from Cassini data that the rings are much younger than Saturn. And that's what's really exciting about this is we started to figure some stuff out about Saturn's rings way back in the 70s. You know, when the, when the Voyager spacecraft, you know, went close to Saturn, we were getting some of our first ever real-time, up-close data of this planet and its ring system. But even some of the stuff that we discovered back then we're finding out not to be true thanks to the data from Cassini. And that's why Cassini is such an important mission in our lifetime of space exploration. It is not only allowing us to pull the curtain back on Saturn and its formation and its ring formation, but we're able to apply that science to literally the way our solar system was created and formed as well. And we're going to continue to talk about this because it's continually exciting about all the new research and data that we're getting from Cassini. And uh, finally, I'm just going to leave it with the look back at Cassini's final mission from NASA and JPL. And here's that. Systems ACS-1, we just had transition to high rate mode, and uh, we are in the atmosphere. Radio signal still holding, 30 seconds. Spacecraft has just crossed 10 degrees north latitude, altitude 1,000 miles. Copy, thank you. Okay, we call loss of signal at 115546. Just heard the signal from the spacecraft is gone and within the next 45 seconds, so will be the spacecraft. Uh, I hope you're all as deeply proud of this amazing accomplishment. Congratulations to you all. This has been an incredible mission, an incredible spacecraft, and you're all an incredible team. I'm going to call this the end of mission. Project manager off the net. We're here to discuss a magnificent mission that had an amazing end. There it is. This is Cassini. Next picture. This is also Cassini. Yes. 
When I look back over the Cassini mission, I, I see a mission that was running a 13-year marathon of scientific discovery. And this last orbit was just the last lap. And so we stood in celebration of successfully completing the race. And this is a view in the infrared at five microns. You can see the heat energy coming out of Saturn. And this is the place where Cassini took its final plunge. It's not an end, but really a beginning. And the discoveries that Cassini has made over the past 13 years in orbit have rewritten the textbooks of Saturn, have discovered worlds that could be habitable, and have guaranteed that we will return to that ringed world. So next up, I wanted to talk about an upcoming launch, uh, very historical. It is the next launch of the Falcon Heavy, and this time it's bringing in a bunch of satellites and science into space as we keep inching our way closer to that first ever Crew Dragon launch manned mission on top of a Falcon Heavy, which will be coming very, very soon. But um, some of the science that's coming up on this new Falcon Heavy launch is really, really exciting. One of those being NASA's Green Propellant Infusion Mission, the GPIM. Uh, this is currently scheduled for that, for that launch, and it is part of a technology te testing mission dubbed STP-2. Not Stone Temple Pilots 2, but STP-2. GPIM is a small box-shaped uh, spacecraft that will be powered by green technology and will test out this low toxicity propellant in space for the first time, according to NASA. And if you guys are unfamiliar with the Falcon Heavy, there's tons of stuff of, of the other test launches that have happened, but there's this really great animation that SpaceX put out all about the Fa Falcon Heavy and its upcoming missions. And here is that. <laughs> So exciting that we are inching ever closer to having that Crew Dragon launch. 
very, very soon on the Falcon Heavy, and that uh, all of the tests seem to have been going very well, except for that one mistake. But that's how you do rocket tests. They're not all going to go. You do you test them out to make sure, you know, you, you work out all the bugs. But it's really interesting about this new fuel because I was just saying the other day to my wife that um, the ne- I believe the next huge technological advancement of humankind is going to be propulsion. We need new propulsion. We, are, we cannot even expect to be an interplanetary society or even continue to remain on Earth only on fossil fuels. We're going to need some other type of propulsion. And this seems really promising. The clean propellant, a hydroxyl ammonium nitrate fuel oxidizer mix called, very scientific, AFM315E, will serve as an alternative to hydrazine, which is a highly toxic compound used in rocket fuel to power satellites and spacecraft today. Steve Jerzyk, the Associate Administrator of NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, said it's important that we develop technology that increases protections for launch personnel and the environment that and that has to, the potential to reduce costs. Right now, most spacecraft run on that hydrazine, but NASA's new fuel, this green fuel, boasts nearly 50% more efficient, promising longer missions and using less propellant, which is two obstacles we have to get over. If we keep talking about we're going to make it to Mars, that is a long time in space, and we can't be burning a ton of fossil fuel to get there because we're not going to have the fossil fuel once we get there. The fuel is also higher in density, which means more of it can be stored in a smaller space. Higher density, you know, so you know you have... A lot of fuel can be used in a smaller container, which is great. Also, it has a lower freezing point, so it actually requires less spacecraft power to maintain its temperature. So all of these are in the wind column for this green fuel. Really, the final piece of the puzzle is testing it in space, and that's what NASA is going to do. On this Falcon Heavy, we're going to send this small spacecraft that will be powered by this green fuel. Compared with hydrazine, the fuel is actually much safer for humans as well. Dana Ice, the Technology Demonstration Missions Program Executive at NASA Space Technology Mission Directorate, said it's pretty benign and we think that it can be loaded at universities or other environments where you're not typically doing propellant loading operations. You can send it through FedEx so it's safe enough to be FedExed around the country. Now, this green fuel initiative is not the only thing going up on the Falcon Heavy on June 24th. 24 satellites, actually, including a pair of identical ones, will be launched next week. These twin satellites, called ETBEX, short for Enhanced Tandem Beacon Experiment, will stay very close to home. As they orbit close to Earth, they'll provide scientists with essential information about how radio signals can be disrupted as they pass through the planet's upper atmosphere. Also, to help protect satellites in space, NASA is exposing a small spacecraft to a whole lot of space radiation. The NASA Space Environment Test Beds, or SET, mission is currently scheduled to also launch on this mission of the Falcon Heavy rocket as part of a technology testing mission dubbed the Space Test Program 2. That's part of the STP-2 program. SET aims to study space weather, which refers to the weather conditions within our solar system and how radiation affects spacecraft in order to build better equipped ones for future space exploration. Again, for longer duration space flight and space flight that's going to bring us farther into our solar system, we need to be testing out these types of things with radiation and figure out, you know, are we building the most efficient best spacecraft, not only for the tech that we want to be sending, but also for the human beings we eventually want to put on these spacecraft. 
That's why it's so exciting to talk about this stuff every week here, right here on the science segment because space exploration is not science fiction anymore. And every single day, NASA, SpaceX, Blue Origin, JPL, all of these companies are working together to fuel, to fuel literally fuel our next advances in space exploration. And it's really exciting. And we'll continue to talk about them every single week right here on Fuel by Deathcast.